you ever regret your decision to go to Ukraine? No, not at all. Not at any point? Not when you're being shot at? Not when you're sat behind a wall? No. Missing home, missing no. the comforts? You don't know what I know. We will protect Mr. Zelensky asked for some volunteers. Fifth day I made the decision I was going to go. And I got really, really scared. And I thought that we were all going to die. And I knew I'd regret it. If, if, I didn't, if I didn't go, there's people that buy us radios, there's people that buy us socks, and the army's got it all, but we don't have enough. I think 20% 20, 20 minimum of the war effort uh, comes from civilian volunteers, probably mostly in Europe. Chris and Andrew went missing on the 6th of January. They, they went to Solodar to evacuate a woman. There's young, beautiful people. You know, Andrew was a geneticist. He's got published papers. Uh, he's a PhD scientist. Chris Parry was a running coach in Truro. Young people who come to Ukraine like go-getters and they're risking their life day in and day out for stubborn people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who don't want to go. I drove over two anti-personnel mines in a town called Solodar. My Pajero blew up every window, blasted out every component. I suffered, I guess what's called a traumatic brain injury. Let me ask you something, Brendan. Did you want to die? Brandon, welcome. Thanks for having me, Ty. Real pleasure. It's an honour, mate. How long have you been back in the UK now? I arrived on the 8th. Okay. I uh, flew into Liverpool. I, I've got family in Liverpool, and I've been doing uh, various YouTube uh, speaking engagements. Mm -hmm. And I just came down from London last night. Amazing, mate. Yeah. I mean, for, for, the, for the guys that are viewing at home, Brandon's a combat medic, and he's been in Ukraine for how long? Just over 13 months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Brendan, before we get into that, I'd like to go a little bit further back and start yeah. from the beginning to really try and understand you and who you are. Mm. So, early years. Talk to me about your early years. Can I bang through it a point form? You can pick you can pick what you like out of it. Go for it, mate. Yeah. I grew up in a small town called Mermachine, New Brunswick, in Canada, on the east coast, on the Atlantic. Uh my family's quite well known there. Mm -hmm. um, For what? My grandfather uh, was a, the man about the man about town. Yeah, back in the day, owned a lot of nightclubs. Oh, yeah, had his hand in this and that. My kind of guy. Yeah, uh, six children. I, I grew up with my grandparents, so that's kind of important. All the girls would have at least one university degree. They'll speak. They all speak French. They're bilingual. Uh, the men all have criminal records. So my father and uncle were a bit of the princes. Okay. Yeah. My father was a bit of a womanizer. But I, uh, yeah, no, after I was born, about a year after um, my mother died. Okay. Uh, I, I have no living memory of my mother. She, she committed suicide. Uh, my father didn't really step up to the plate and uh, he, he was living in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, my father was involved in organized crime. But I, I live with my grandparents. I grew up with his parents. And um, yeah, that was kind of hard growing up as a kid. Why do you live with your grandparents, not your parents? Of course. And I, I only knew later on in life, uh, I, I've analyzed my past. It's not easy growing up in a small town being the kid whose mother killed herself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. M my grandmother drank a lot and she died when I was 11. Mm. My auntie raised me. She really stepped up to the plate. Um, my father's sister, big, big inspiration to me in my life. Uh, she got away from our small town, uh, moved to the city when she was 23, you know, early eighties. Um, yeah, she was, my family used to make fun of her back in the day, but when you think about it, she's doing everything people do now. Uh, I, I come from a small town in Canada. Uh, she brought a friend of color back to our hometown once an Indian woman mm -hmm. and, and people stared. I don't even think it was racism. I think it was just, they'd never seen, they'd never seen, we had one black man in our town, you know? Yeah. One Chinese family uh, who, who made the food. Um, she had gay friends. <laughs> you know, that was, that was wild growing up in the early 90s that like people said a lot of nasty things. But, but my auntie, she, she came home after my grandmother died. Yeah. Uh, she'd been all over the world. She, she even worked with a missionary program in Africa in, in the early 90s before the internet traveling before the internet. Um, yeah, she made me work. She taught me a lot of things. Uh, I didn't get my own way with her. 
we didn't even have uh, we didn't have Sky. We didn't have t- you know we had three channels and an aerial. So uh, I owe a lot to her. Sounds like an amazing one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, the older I get, the more I appreciate that stuff. You know, mm-hmm. I um, I joined the army reserve. I joined the army in uh, Canada. In Canada, uh, I got into, I started smoking dope at a young age. So smoking spliffs and and drinking and and I had a lot of bad friends. But I, but I was always fascinated with the army. And why do you think that was fascinated with the army? Yeah. Well, considering your granddad and dad were part of the underworld. Wheelers and dealers. Well, on my mother's side, uh, I never knew my grandfather. He 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 actually died. I learned later in life. He, he took his own life. Okay. He had a long battle with cancer. Uh, he he was in the um, in Germany after the Cold War mm-hmm. with the Royal Canadian Air Force. He 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 was an aircraft mechanic. They dealt with a lot of chemicals back then. You didn't. A lot of people died of cancer. Uh, he, he had a long battle with cancer. Uh, took his own life, but but he he served for about twenty five years in the Air Force. Um, his father fought in World War II. Uh, his grandfather in World War I. Um, I always grew up with a fascination of history, you know, things like World War II. I, I watched all those old documentaries, black yeah. and white. I love that stuff. Um, but yeah, t- to me, it seemed like I could be part of something, something like I'd, I'd fit in if I was in the army because you have to. Um, a lot of my friends I grew up with, they... Uh, they died at young ages, drugs. I, I've had battles in and out with that, but I think the army saved my life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's your relationship like now with your dad? We don't talk very often. Not at all. I, I always wanted him to be my dad, but uh, he was very he was a man about town. Uh, very, very popular. And part of the way of joining the army was to get away from my father. People always telling me what a great guy my father was, how I look just like my father. But, but this great guy that they always talk about, I, I didn't, I never really seen him. Mm. He wasn't bad to me. He just, he, he wasn't there, you know. He's not reached out since you've been doing your YouTube stuff over, over in Ukraine. Mm, we've gone years without talking. Okay. Three, four or five years. I'm happy for him. Uh, we did talk once uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, I, I have a brother who's about 20 years younger than me and f- the best I know of, I've only met him about five, six times. I haven't lived in Canada many years mm-hmm. here in England, mainly as an adult. From what I know, he's a real good father to Spencer, my younger brother. And, and do you know what? I can accept that. And that makes me happy. Yeah. He's an older man now. Yeah. Times change, people change. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I moved to England, you know, at 20. The army was my chance to come over here uh, to transfer to the British Army. That was an opportunity for me to do something completely different, uh, completely out of the box. And uh, do, do you think the army pulling you in was part of having that family feeling that you maybe didn't feel as much growing up? Never really thought about it much like that, but... You know, that unity. A sense of purpose, though. A mm. definite sense of purpose. And not that I was any great soldier at all. Um, uh, they, I had no combat tours when I, when I had an opportunity to transfer to here. Uh, I had a chance to join the Black Watch, okay. the Scottish Regiment. And I'm not a hard man, but, but they are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, Army's not a big part of my story. Um, I didn't last a year here in the Army. I uh, went through training, went to Northern Ireland, uh, Belfast. Um, I failed a drug test not even a year in the army. And uh, I, I was given a chance. <clears throat> should I stay or should I go? Yeah. M- many boys were slung out. But um, I, I did a lot of drugs when I was younger. The army kind of kept me away. I, I, I went home for a Christmas leave once and uh, it um, it started with a spliff. It ended up with a, with a car upside down with class A's everywhere. <sighs> yeah, a, t- a two week binge. Um, I, I was really depressed coming back. I got released. Um, they let me out of the army, um, not a bad discharge. Um, I regretted that for a lot of years, but I I wasn't right in the head, you know, Mm. but I didn't want to go home. There was London. (laughs) 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 There was London. I'm just thinking about what you're saying there, Brendan, if like you've, you've grown up with a lot of adversity, a lot of challenges. Yeah. You've moved about from different members of your family to bring you up. You've joined the army. You've come here. 
There's a lot going on there. Yeah. Have you ever kind of tried to delve into that and fix that sort of, or or make sense of that in your own head? Whether that's seeing a professional, whether that's kind of, you know, some self-development journey, or have you just sort of put it to one side and carried on? Well, that's why I'm happy I'm doing your podcast. Um because I hope we could talk more about those things than all the explosions and the hero shit that people, the clickbait shit that people yeah. want to hear. And I, I've done, I've done a fair bit of that, you know. Yeah, I can imagine. In the past year, um, I partied, I traveled, I, I worked in sales, I made six to eight hundred pounds a week cash, but uh, living in bed sits, you know. I was twenty six years old. Uh, I made a lot of money. Been all over the world traveling. Uh, I, I haven't had a drink or a drug. I've been in a 12-step program since I was 26. Um, and how old are you now? I'm 37. Wow. Uh, in Bakhmut on January 1st, I celebrated 11 years clean and sober. I've not, I've not taken a mind-altering substance. Yeah. Um, I've also done four years of therapy during that time okay. through three different stints. I've had a lot of time to look at those things. Um I had a chance, I, I moved to Bournemouth by pure chance. Um, I lived here for eight years, right right when Corona began, I moved. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had two and a half years clean through an, a 12-step program. I, I worked the 12 steps in my life. Uh, I even got a bit of education. I, I, I went to uni for, for a couple of years. Um, when I moved to this town... What did you study, Brendan? Sorry. Yeah, I... I I didn't know what I wanted to study. In Canada, uni's four years minimum, not like three years here. And you're encouraged for the first two years to take as many courses as you can. Uh, even in a science background that has to be more focused, they can take a lot of electives. Mm -hmm. And uh, to find in the first year what you want to major in, that's, that's the idea. Um, I really took an interest in economics. I really liked economics. Uh, macroeconomics to look at the relations of, of how things work. And people think economics is about money, but I found a lot of uh, human nature. You know, I, I worked in sales work. I worked the events industry. I was a market trader for many years, right up till Corona. I, when I got clean, I became self-employed. I made a good business out of that, but I learned a lot about human nature. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that, that's my biggest interest. Um, through therapy, through 12-step, trying to listen more it's not easy because i like to talk but <laughs> yeah nothing wrong with that man. but trying to listen to people more but when i came to this town in bournemouth uh this is a real town of second chances you know there's a lot of people who've come here because the uni um i think before the budget cuts some years ago this was a big place for uh, rehab yeah uh, now that's not my story rehab but, but it was yeah you're right yeah there's a lot of people in this town who turn good mm -hmm. okay that there's a lot of trouble in this town too but there's a lot of people that had good jobs and they went on to do great things. So I was part of that here for eight years. Um, yeah, I, I probably did most, the most of my growth in my life living here from about, oh, 27 to 35. Good years. Yeah. But I've spent most of that period of my life here as well. It's a great town. Yeah. It's a great town. Um, the boxing community. Uh, I, I was going to say you boxed a bit, didn't you? Didn't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. I... Um, I, my father for one time actually owned the largest boxing gym in Canada. And looking back now, I know it was a front, but some good fighters came through there yeah. for the Canadian level. And, uh, I always loved it. See, I, I never thought I could box. I didn't have athletic ability. I've got hands the size of a girl. This yeah. is, this is all true. You know, um, most things I've ever come up against in my life are, are stronger than me. Um, but a friend of mine, uh, he was an unlicensed fighter. Uh, some people call it white collar. Yes, but right. I don't like that term because when you're fighting up in the Midlands and up north, there's nothing white collar about that. <laughs> and I think it's a much more brutal level than down here in the south. And, and he asked me to be his corner man. Uh, ooh, I'm going to be a corner man. You know, I thought about that. And uh, I said, well, I can never fight. And uh, I asked friends here in Bournemouth. I said, w how could I learn about being a corner man? And one of my mates says, this is a big boxing town, Bournemouth, you know, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a big part of the culture. My mates say, you go, go meet Steve Bendel. Steve Bendel will teach you everything. He, there's no one in this town who actually knows more about the sport of boxing. And, um, you know, you interviewed Chris Billum-Smith here once. That's right. He's a hero of mine. 
Is he? I, I look up to Chris Billum Smith every day. Uh, maybe not every day. I've got my own life. <laughs> um, yeah, he's a great guy. I thought about going to the gym for one week, even just to ask to learn. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the scariest things in my life. Uh, go to Parkstone, go to where the gym is. I know the gym. But walk up them stairs. Up them stairs. I could hear the speed bags. I could hear the movement. I've not been in a boxing gym since I was a little kid. And uh, it took a lot of courage to walk up them stairs just to ask a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I met my friend Ross. He became a good friend of mine. And I met CBS. Yep. Chris Wooden had maybe four pro fights by that time. And... You know, he he was a champion long before this fight coming up, I'll tell you. We talked for like a half hour that day. And he said, yeah, I got a fight coming. That was only an afterthought. He wasn't trying to sell me a ticket. Yeah, yeah. Um, he says, uh, when, when's your fight? Next week. Said, well, you've got a supporter in me. And uh, I bought a couple tickets. I, I, I think I went to his, his fourth pro fight. Uh, that was at the O2, was it the one at yeah, the O2? Yeah, yeah in Boscombe. That. That's a great venue. I was there, yeah. But uh, Chris really embodies, I think I've said this to you before, the whole athlete mentality, like his mindset. Mm. He's been teetotal probably eight odd years, eight, nine years, I think. Fantastic. He, lives, he lives and breathes it, if you know what I mean. So yes, he does. So that deserves it as much as probably him. That's it. But through him, like he, he's kind of been the spearhead for our community. A lot of people feel that when Chris is winning, when Chris wins, I feel like I win. Yeah, yeah. I really do get, I don't get that from any of the other boys. Uh, there's a couple of them here that are aspiring. They're cocky little shits, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. But I was I was that age too once. Part of the territory, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I got all involved with that. And and, and eventually I, I I learned to spar. I, I got way more than I expected out of it. Uh, I dealt with the fear. And after a while, you know, I, I went to a show one night, a, a white collar show. I was going to be the bell ringer. And someone pulled out and I begged uh, the promoter of the show, let me in there, <laughs> let me in there. He thought I was joking. Um, yeah, he put me in and, and Jake Best, a man I look up to, he, how many Guinness Book of World Records has he got now, <laughs> that man, you know? <laughs> oh, man. He's like David Goggins, you know what I mean? It's like, what are you doing, Jake? I'm running. He was my corner man. And, and I, my first fight on, on about, oh, about 30 minutes notice, I went and got a pair of, pair of, <laughs> pair of shorts. They weren't boxing shorts. I was in trainers. I, I had a pretty good go. Um, Fair play. Yeah. But all, that's all I wanted at the boxing. I wanted to, I realized I wanted to become a trainer because yep. I'm too old. I'd never achieve. So I, I worked every day, day in, day out for a couple of years. And, and my goal was to become an am amateur and just get past the novices. And then I thought I could train people like Chris, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. maybe not Chris, but yeah, I just, thanks. Everyone wants to hear about Ukraine, but some of my best memories and, and like, my best stuff in my life, it was in this town. It was it was here in Bournemouth. It's a um, great town. It is a great community. Yeah. You, this whole piece about starting drugs and drink pretty early. Yeah. How early are we talking? I would have think, well, if you want to, I probably had my first cigarette about six years old. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I might have an uncle... My old uncle, everyone has an Uncle John. Yeah. Uh, probably gave me some punch at the party. I don't know, maybe around eight years old. When, when, when how old were you when it was a problem? When if it was you a look problem. Back now, you might not have realized at the time, but when you thought, right, I can't actually stop drinking or taking controlled substances. Probably around 15 years old when I'm lying to the doctor to go get a script. Okay. About ADHD medication. Of course, in Canada, it's different to here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Get your Ritalin. And, uh, so you're on, like, prescription no. as well prescription drugs uh not no i don't take anything now but i um yeah when i was 15 i heard you could go to the doctor and tell them you have adhd and they give you they give you the ritalin yeah um that that progressed you know that progressed i, I had a lifestyle like I, I i don't like when people think of addiction slowly as like a heroin junkie in an alley mm -hmm. um but what about people who neglect their families their wives you might see a guy you work with who's a bit edgy but he's a good worker what's his home life like with his wife, his children, what some people call functioning alcoholics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there Is was that what you were, functioning? <sighs> I never missed a day of work. So if I saw you out and about, I wouldn't think, God, he's a mess. Maybe. You might think I'm a twat. Uh, you might think I'm a twat. But, you know, for some years, I, uh, I was smoking about an eighth of weed a day, a uh, wow. skunk, or maybe even up to a quarter, uh, and I wouldn't dare have a beer. I, dare, I wouldn't have a pint. I wouldn't have a spirit. 
because I was scared if I had a drink in me, if somebody offered me a line of Charlie. That was my logic sometimes. For months at a time, I wouldn't do class A's. I would, I would, smoke, I would smoke marijuana because I felt that was safe. Do you understand? Yeah, of course. Is an eighth a day, a quarter a day, a productive human being? Not for me, no. I don't think for many people. Yeah. What, what, what was that point where you thought, it's got to change? Was there a particular point that sticks in your mind where yeah, you think, her name was Kate, her name was Kate Kelly. Uh, oh, person. Yeah, I was going to, I was, Love. I, I wanted to marry her. We were infatuated and I screwed the whole thing up. And uh, because of drink and drugs. Yeah, because of drink and drugs, because of my own ego, because of everything. And a real, real good woman, uh, you know, took a lot of years to make peace and make amends to her. A, a real apology, not just sorry. Uh, but I thought, I'll never work it out with her, but life can't continue this way. Mm -hmm. It was a woman. You want to hear about Ukraine? Or you I want, do. Or you want to, or you want to dig deeper no, into this? No, no, I do. Ukraine's next. I'm just, I'm trying to make sense of that, that piece. I've got this young lad sat in front of me. Yeah. That, has probably been yearning for love his whole life from a family that probably hasn't been around to give it to him. No. And then finds it from someone. I found it in the 12 steps. That changed. I found it in the kids here in the amateur boxing. I, I had a lot of money, a lot of money when I lived here. Very powerful that, yeah. what you just said. What, boxing? About the love piece. The love piece. I found it here. I found it here in Bournemouth. Mate, okay. Let's, let's go on a little bit. So, You've sure. moved to England. You've joined the military in Canada. You've then transferred to England. You fucked it up. You've been fucked kicked it all out. Up. Yep. You've then sort of like found yourself in Bournemouth. Yeah, made some friends. Got into boxing. Really enjoyed the community here, which is a great town. Paid my bills. Never screwed anyone. Paid your bills. Never screwed anyone. Was self-employed. Was doing okay. Clean. Yeah. Twelve steps therapy. Then the Ukraine war starts. Yeah. So prior to that. Were you feeling any sort of compulsion towards going and doing humanitarian stuff anywhere else in the world? Never, or is that never, like, never. So how the fuck do you go from? I just wanted to. I just wanted Corona. Corona through. We're not even. We're not talking about Corona. Okay. No. Uh, we're not entertaining. Well, we can you. touch on it. But that's <laughs> that. That basically screwed everything. Screwed my money. Screwed everything. I had to work for the first time in a living. I mm. became a stone worker. I was very good at it. Okay. Worked for an Estonian company. Worked all over Scandinavia. Traveled. I worked for a living. I liked that. Um, I knew a lot of Estonians, uh, borders Russia. I never wanted to be humanitarian. All I wanted to be was an amateur boxing coach, you know, to work with kids like, like p young people I met here in this town, like my friend Anna or Wesley. Um, that's, that's all I wanted to do. I wanted to make a good living. I wanted to have a nice house like everybody wants. And I wanted to be a boxing coach. Do you think, I'll just quickly touch on it before we go on to Ukraine. Do you think you wanted to be a boxing coach for the kids so you could stop them going down the route you went down? Yes, but... Or was there more to it? I found joy out of seeing other people succeed. And I'm not just saying that as, because a lot of people like to talk about that. Um, but when they when they were winning, I felt like I was winning. Genuine felt, joy. Yeah, yeah. And, but I could, I'd rather stand on the side. You know, I don't, I don't want to be in their book. Oh, thank you so much. You know what I mean? Like, um, but just to have a part in some, to have a chapter in someone's life, you know? I... I I found joy. Mm. I found joy in Amazing. focusing on other people than my fucked up head. But yeah. I, I got kind of got well in the process to a certain degree. I'm a little bit crazy. I think we're all a little bit crazy. A little bit, a little bit. I think that's what makes life beautiful. Mm -hmm. That we're all a little bit weird. Yeah. Yeah. I always say that. Most interesting people. Of course. And a lot of people that you find that you and I might call bland or might call boring or might call not weird. They're just hiding it. Generally, what are you up. like on your own at home? Or what are you like in your own head? I always say this to my friends. Like if people could hear my thoughts, they probably wouldn't think of me the way they do. Because I think some weird shit in my weird head. Weird shit. <laughs> yeah, but those bland and boring people, I don't know what their house is like, but they, they usually tend to drive nicer cars than me. But, but that's what I'm saying. They do for yeah. a decade, two decades, three decades. But do they, does it then implode? Yeah. Because they're not letting any of their kind of weird and wonderfulness out. <laughs> <laughs> Eccentricity, some people call it. Yeah. So Ukraine, so how did that come about? Yeah. So the war started. Day three of the war. I, I was obsessed with it on telly. Uh, I was very grateful that it took the corona news cycle out. 
Okay. okay. Um, Mr. Zelensky asked for some volunteers yep. uh, to come over. And I found that very, very, very compelling. And uh, I can't explain what happened to me, but I was probably the physically strongest I'd ever been in my life at the time. Training all the time, and now I'm a stone worker, right? Yeah. Lifting stone up five flights of stairs in Stockholm, <laughs> you know, like like London, you know. There's no lifts, <laughs> uh, not for this stuff. And all of a sudden, I got obsessed with Ukraine like a drug, purely like a drug. Okay, just like I committed to boxing, like I committed to other things in my life, productively. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden, within two days, from doing all oh, about thirty pull-ups, I could do about forty-five. That's a significant jump. Huge jump. Huge jump. Huge jump. Um, Takes people years to do one. My physical strength increased. Uh, people probably wouldn't believe that. Uh, I, I went into like an animal mode of maybe four hours sleep a night, thinking Ukraine, Ukraine. Um, I started making plans quietly. I didn't tell my employer. I did not tell my girlfriend. I didn't tell anybody. And uh, after, after, well, the th third day he asked, Fifth day, I made the decision I was going to go. And I got really, really scared and very emotional inside. Um, I believed in my heart that I should go because I felt compelled to go. And uh, like William Wallace, the most famous speech in Braveheart. And if you were to look back and you had one chance, just one chance, would you take it? You know, he was talking about them, old men. You can go home and you live today, or you can fight the English. No offense. No, no, it's all good. Russia. Everyone needs a villain. Um, and I knew I'd regret it if if I didn't if I didn't go. You know what I mean? If I didn't go, I would I would regret it. I would be. Um, and I thought that we were all going to die because I had no war reference. I've been never been to a combat situation before. Uh, as I got older and older, I didn't romanticize war. I didn't even think about it. Um, and, uh, oh, about a couple of days later, I didn't tell anybody. I rang my auntie, my auntie Jennifer, the one, the one I told you about. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I bawled my eyes out on the phone, like a little girl to her. And I, 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 uh, I told her, I said, uh, I, I, I have to go help. And, uh, I don't know what's going to happen, but I just want you to be proud of me. See, uh, I wanted her to be so proud of me, you know, like when she came to visit me here in Bournemouth one year and, and I, I didn't want my uncle to come. I wanted her to come so it could be just me and her. Mm -hmm. And I insisted on paying for everything. And, and she got to meet my work colleagues, my friends. And I didn't, it wasn't in a flash way, but I just wanted her to be proud and see like how I make good with my life. And maybe even that, you know, if, if, if she needed, when she got old, maybe I could take care of her, you know, mm -hmm. um, I was so glad I was thinking about that stuff. I, whatever happened, I just wanted her to know that I had a good life and she, and she was proud of me. Um, and then I weren't scared anymore. I, I didn't have any fear in me. Uh, I told my girlfriend, I told everybody. Uh, I didn't tell my employer right till the end. I told them I needed to take a, a family emergency. Uh, when well, I just never came back. Well, no, 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 no. I still have a job on paper. I, I came I came out of the closet to them. <laughs> I uh, they told me they were so happy for me and uh, they they gave me all my pay, all my holiday pay, and I still have a job on paper waiting for me. I never had a sick wow. day. I, I don't take sick days. Um, so I was I was a good employee. Um, I, I left I left on 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 March fourteenth, two thousand and twenty one. 22. 22. It's, not, it's not been going on that long. 22. God. Okay. My, my timing's off since COVID. Yeah. 24th of February, the war started. Uh, I met up with some Swedish boys, ex-Swedish Rangers, uh, Swedish Marines. Two of them were combat medics from Afghanistan. Five of us crossed the border on March 16th. And we joined Hospitaller's Medical Battalion in Kiev. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm Let me ask you something, Brendan. Did you want to die? No, I didn't want to die. I didn't want to die at all. I've still got I've still got all the money. I, I was working to rebuild. I still have on paper a business I started in Sweden. I was going to do it all over again. Um, that's that's still locked up in a business account. It's not much. It's like three grand. Um, I had everything to live for. I never wanted to die, Ty. Not at all. I just I just felt a compulsion inside of me. Go and find out. Be a humanitarian, whatever the hell that is. Uh, be be a soldier, but 
I didn't want to be a soldier because I didn't think I had the skills. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't a super, super underwater knife fighter. Just that guy who come in here, like before the meeting, who set this up. Oh, you got to go meet that guy. He's an SBS, SBS this, SAS that. No disrespect to those people, but people are people to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not just saying, I don't care if you're a binman, if, if you've got good banter. Um, I, I didn't want any of that. I didn't want to be responsible for other people's lives. Like like I had in my head, maybe in, if in a combat situation, if I can't change a magazine in 1.5 seconds, everyone's going to die because of me. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. So you've had some basic military training, right? From when years you were in the ago, army. Years ago. When you got out there, did you get any extra military training? Did you get any medical training? Like you, obviously you're a medic. Yeah, I have no medical training. Um, we were recruited into Hospitaller's Medical Battalion. Um, it's a volunteer on paid battalion in the Ukrainian army. Uh, so how does that work? Do they speak English? Some do, some don't. Uh, Generally, people with a medical background are more educated, so there's a, definitely a higher level of English than the average soldier. Okay. Uh, we went to Kiev, and that was scary to take a train to Kiev because the Battle of Kiev. Um, Oleg, our contact, met us, and he said, right away, they don't want to know whether you're you're a this or a that or the, what are you? I'm a medic. What are you, a paramedic? Okay, what are you? And I thought, well, I'll be an ambulance driver because I'm pretty handy with a sprinter in a transit, you know? <laughs> Uh, they said, no, we don't have any drivers. Uh, do you want to be a gunner? We need gunners now. We lo we we have some positions available. Um, and I just, I said, well, do you want to help or not? And and I that's not what I came for. I said, I'll do it. Um, all those Swedish boys who, who were shit hot. I mean, just for the listeners and viewers, gunner, what does that mean? What are you doing? What does that well, actually entail? Well, I suppose you might have a, a Kalashnikov, an AK-74 rifle. Um, maybe you might shoot enemies. Um, on an ambulance crew, it might be for security, you know, transport patients. So you've gone out to become a medic. Or whatever. No, to be oh, whatever. You, to you be actually a, went out with an open mind, yeah. With an open mind. And so whatever uh, it took to help. Yeah, whatever it took to help. Without getting too political, had you done any research here about what was actually going on out there? And then when you got out there, were your eyes open to realize it's like a whole different world to what maybe me sat here in front of the news channel was hearing about? Well, it's not what I thought it was. And the reason I, I, I stay is not the same reason I came. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know nothing about politics and there's experts you can talk to. I, I will never give you an opinion. And I've heard, a, I've heard a few interviews of people who come back from Ukraine. Um, some of them tell the truth. Some of them not so. It, I, I can only tell you my experience. So you, you went out for one reason. I can't talk about politics. Okay. Right. We'll part of that. You went out for one reason. Yeah. You said it's different for the reason that's made you stay. Yeah. So why are you staying? 13 months is a long time. Longer than any tour that any military oper operative would do. Mm -hmm. Apparently Marines did 13 months in Vietnam. Army did 12. I, you, I used to read books. Okay. Yeah. I but mean, generally, I believe they're six-month tours when we nowadays, were Afghan and Iraq. Well, we're not as hard as them old men. Like Joe Lewis back in the day, you know, Rocky Marciano. We're not made like them, are we? Uh, <laughs> no, the thing is... Um, so what's keeping you there? Well, when I joined that battalion, uh, we, we trained. I, I was put on a ten, almost a 10-day medical course in a basement of a church in mm -hmm. Kiev. Very prominent church, St. Michael's. It's no secret now. That was our old base. Joe Biden's been at St. Michael's. Has he? I was there first. Okay, it's a it's a prominent place in Kiev, uh, and in that basement, I I, I took a course uh, for almost ten days. By the third day, I was on IVs. Okay, uh, that's you know an, an intravenous. That mentally, that was a big block. Um, and what happened at nighttime in Ukrainian? They had an ultrasound machine. You know, yeah. they got donated. We had a lot of stuff coming and going. And I, I just sit there and watch the Ukrainians at night in the side. And, and there's this cute little girl. Uh, she's, uh, I had a little bit of a crush on her. Um, and, uh, and I asked her just out of curiosity, um, I said, what's your medical background? She says, I'm a, I'm a neurosurgeon. Wow. Okay. Now, you, you know, when people say, oh, it's not rocket science, it's not brain surgery. <laughs> right then it hit me. I said, holy, can I swear? Yeah, of course. Holy fuck. Um, <laughs> my whole life on paper didn't amount to, to anything. I don't mean to be cruel on myself, but I didn't achieve in boxing. My business, whatever reason, didn't achieve. But she followed this pathway, 
you know, I hope she had help along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was a neurosurgeon intern, almost fully qualified. And she chose to leave Lviv to come serve on an ambulance crew. Uh, and, and in principle, I'm in charge of her security. And, and I thought, my God, how, life. how many, how many brilliant minds do we have here? And, and in principle, I, I value my own life, but in Ukraine, I value different lives differently. And I, people can say whatever they want in the comments. She's more valuable than me. Without a doubt, she is more valuable than me. I'm responsible for her. And, and I felt I ex internally, I accepted that responsibility. Do, do you understand? Just, just one of those a Hamlet moment. Yeah. Um, I hear you. I, I seen my first, uh, my first combat, my, you fast forward a bit. I, I worked a month in a hospital about 25 kilometers from the Russians first hospital. Um, I learned what good pre hospital care is, what bad is. Um, I've, I learned how to draw up at least 10 medications. Okay. in the dosages for what would be required. I learned to be like a referee, like the third man in the ring, a good one that you would never get in the way in surgeries. Uh, I, I administered drugs for concussions, which can take 40 minutes of workout with 10 guys, uh, which frees up doctors, nurses. I've assisted in surgery, uh, by ho holding back skin, holding hemostatic clamps in there. Um, I've, um, I, I got involved. You know what I mean? I was willing to have a go even without the language. When an ambulance had come in, I learned you had to be one of the first people. There'd be five people on a casualty. And I learned how to follow the whole algorithm through of what's called medical stabilization. Mm -hmm. But because I didn't speak the language, if I jumped in two minutes late, it didn't work. There's a whole process, you know, with scissors. Do you know how much work in a mass casualty event you can do with just scissors, paramedic scissors? If you've got 20 wounded guys with bloody clothes that have to be cut off around a tourniquet, a tourniquet that stops the bleeding. I've got to get their phone out. I've got to get their passport, their documents, get grenades and radios off them. But those documents are so important if a man lives or dies that they can be identified. Um, so the, if he dies, so the family can have closure. You know, the unknown soldier. There's a lot of that in Ukraine. We, we take it very serious to, to retrieve bodies whenever possible. But, uh, you it know, some of a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that prepared me uh, to go further, to go on a frontline position, uh, on a medical evac team. And, and that was the biggest surprise for me in the, in the whole war. Um, see, war is unknown. You don't know nothing about war, do you? I didn't. You what I see on films. Yeah. Or hear about in the news. Well, if it was like what I thought it was, we'd all be dead. Um, I read in books about the waiting, 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 until I sat in a house two, three, four kilometers from the Russians, depending on what, what direction you want to you wanna look. Um, I think once it was five days, we didn't have a casualty. It didn't have, didn't have any work to do. Uh, I even stood outside between the two buildings and got a suntan. You know, uh, you have to be careful because of drones. Sometimes the house shakes, the artillery. Uh, I had my first man die in the ambulance, uh, cardiac infarction. That's, that's basically heart failure. Um, I brought him, we brought him back to that same hospital I worked at. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot of that. How did that feel? The loss, your first loss? Well, I think too much. Uh, we were all responsible for it. That same, the same thing he died of, what was called a suck in chest wound, because it lets the air in and they look fine. But in 40 minutes, it can really change. Pressure on the lungs, which turns into pressure on the heart. Um, I didn't feel anything. Uh, I remember when we were cleaning the blood out of the ambulance, I, I was doing CPR, I was doing compressions on him. They, I was in the front of the ambulance, they asked me to come in the back. Apparently I did it for eight minutes. And I was thinking, do you know what I thought? This ain't like Baywatch. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean, CPR? Um, and I cleaned out, we mopped out the ambulance. Uh, we were singing, do you know what we were singing? Another one bites the dust, the whole crew. That's how sick is that? We were, two minutes later, we're joking and smoking. And on the drive back to our position, everybody got quiet. And I, w I was just happy because because uh, there's a supermarket. It, this ain't like Afghanistan. There was a supermarket. And I said, can we stop for ice cream? And and I'm just happy because I have an ice cream. I haven't had an ice cream in three weeks. And uh, everyone's quiet. And I, I said, what's wrong with you, Brandon? That ain't right. You know, you're not right. Like my whole childhood, you know, you're different. You're not right. Don't, don't. Um, why, why do you think you didn't feel anything there? I don't know. 
uh, but I thought it wasn't right. But I just, I've been, I've been along long enough with the therapy and the 12 steps in my life. I said, just let it go. The answer will come later. And uh, the next day I, I felt really, really, really bad. I felt like uh, I'd catch, I'd catch two minutes. I'd be really sad. Then I'd be okay. Yeah, that, that was my first guy. Um, could it could have been shock, you know? Maybe that, that acting the way you're acting. Maybe um, I, I've worked on medical stabilization during the battle, like a improvised hospital. Um, you know, I remember I remember working there. That's that's one of the big reasons I stayed in Ukraine. That 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 was for me. That was like real war. War. Um, I uh, I remember a man. We ran out of we ran out of body bags. You know. I never really thought about that, the shortages we have in Ukraine and and uh, little things happen, you know. Everyone says Ukraine's a corrupt country. That's true to a certain degree. Uh, isn't every country? Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Our politics, Westminster fiddles. But um, I remember a man, we ran out of body bags. We had to we had to wrap them in blankets and gaffer tape them, you know. Um, but I, I I worked there and I and I worked a lot and I helped. And, you know, the head doctor... A first armored brigade. He was an army surgeon his whole life, and he worked with British soldiers, Canadian soldiers. He did United Nations tours, and as busy as we were, I was the first foreigner they'd ever seen. And he he spoke perfect English, and he he came and gave. Uh, I mean, he's a lieutenant colonel, and wow. he came and gave me a hug, like a genuine hug, after like a day and a half working there. Thank you so much for being with us. Do you think a posh Sandhurst boy is going to give me a fucking hug? I'm not trying to have a war of the classes here, but we don't have that. We don't have that there. Um, Brandon, were you? Did you ever suffer any injuries out there yourself? Yeah, I did. Being on that front line. Yeah, I did. That's that's why I'm here today. Um, what medically discharged? No, no, not medically discharged. Uh, I spent four weeks in hospital. I was out of duty for six weeks. In uh, Ukraine. Yeah, I. Um, I drove over two anti-personnel mines in a town called Solodar. Solodar is the biggest part of my war story. Um, it, what vehicle were you in? Uh, Mitsubishi Pajero. And it was beautiful. Not even armoured or anything? No, nope. we just spray paint them green and we go. Yeah. And what happened? The vehicle blew up? Yeah. Um, so I'm in a volunteer battalion and we do rotations. Four weeks, six weeks. I asked my commanding officer permission could I go to Donbass and, and work specifically with the with the National Guard it's, it's a, a, a branch of the army yeah and because uh, because I heard uh, they needed help and um, there was a place called Severodonetsk that featured prominently when Ukraine was kind of still in the news cycle I guess over here and it was being overrun and the whole Ukrainian army just left Severodonetsk and Lisa Cheng so they just abandoned it and, and what happened uh, there was a power vac. Uh, it was like a vacuum. There was no fighting for like two weeks uh, to what becomes Bakhmut. Mm -hmm. Actually, everyone's heard of Bakhmut. Yeah. When I arrived there to help the National Guard, there was no work. They were tired. They just wanted to sleep. Sleep, 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 sleep. And when I arrived in Kramatorsk, the town, uh, that was in July, I felt like I missed the war. And this is what rocked me to the core of all my understandings. At the National Guard base, there pulls up this guy a little bit chunky with like long hair and a goatee. He's a nerd. And he's got two cats in his Jeep and he's got, he's got a shotgun. He's got two cats crawling all over him and he's got a shotgun. And I'm thinking, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> That's one of my best friends. His name's Dimitri. And uh, he grew up in America, mm -hmm. but his parents were Ukrainian. He, he'd lived there for some years before the war. And he is a volunteer with the army. Ukraine's got this thing like it would it might never fly here or if we ever had World War three our governments better accept it certain people rise to the occasion government officials ran they fled you know whether he was the mayor whatever Dmitry was an IT worker in Kiev and after the Battle of Kiev he's got his own story he went to Donbass to help okay. there's a lot of men with a man with a van some of them are armed some of them are not some help with humanitarian he specifically volunteered with the army and and you know what he did he did he was like we called him um uh nova post spetsnaz it's like basically special forces uh, postal man okay he would bring any of your packages that would come that's a big thing in ukraine boys can order stuff online 
he would bring anything from ammo to clothing to whatever right up to the second line of all these towns in Donbass. I met Dimitri. I had no war. I had no casualties. And he said to me, he said one day, he said, do you want to go to Bakhmut and do some sketchy shit? <laughs> of course you said yes. Yeah. Um, we started evacuating civilians from villages. And if you look at the map, they were like little pockets. Mm -hmm. We're going to go get this person, that person. We're going to bring them to Kramatorsk, to Slovians, towns, you know, 20, mm -hmm. 30 kilometers back. And uh, it was crazy, you know, like I, I was seeing more personal action close up than, than I did with the army. Um, and then what happened, uh, not with Dmitry, but with another guy, a Russian speaker, we started going to this town called Solodar. Okay. And and the rumor was, you can't go to Solodar. You can't go to Solodar. It's closed off. Um, we were getting 50 people a day out of that town. You know, wow. I, I started documenting on social media for fundraising. I started with Instagram, then YouTube. S some of that Solodar stuff's where my following went boom. I, I, well, I went boom, but but my following grew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, ar artillery going off in your face, uh, machine guns, all, all that clickbait stuff, the TikTok stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what happened, we were asked to go to East Solodar. And I knew what East Solodar was. I was like, that side of the water is Russian. Mm -hmm. um, but we went, we followed the dead ground. I say machine guns are on the hill. They can't see the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, my last night when I got blowing up, uh, we got nine people out. We got nine people out. We got an old grandmother, a husband, a wife, and four kids, all boys. You know, a little boy, like maybe four, one of them that probably had a, a growth spurt during puberty, you know, if I had to assess them. And I gave a little boy my helmet. Um, the truck couldn't get to their house because of a like a big crater in the ground. Um, I got shot at by a machine gun, like crossing the crossroads where the crater was. Um, but to get across that bridge, the Ukrainians have anti-tank mines, these big pucks. And that was really scary for me. You know, because I I'd not had a lot of experience with that. You have to drive like an S pattern around the mines. Okay. And uh, we went in two vehicles and, and Victor said, uh, you got to get them out. And I bottled it. I got scared. I bottled it. And I said, well, can you drive first? <laughs> and uh, and uh, Philip, who was with us, it was me, Fi Victor and Philip. Uh, Philip stayed. He found more people that wanted to go. Um, I got, I got... I got seven people. He had two in his, his car, like a civilian car. And, and we went back for Philip. But the Russians place anti-personnel mines. Um, so that'll blow your leg off, blow your body off. You know, there's a lot of boys from Afghanistan here in Britain who, who've suffered that. Mm -hmm. um, I know a couple there. Yeah. And they can drop them by airplane. They can, they can actually do it by artillery. that spread mines out pretty accurately. Uh, when we were going back into East Solodar, um, we went down a dirt road through like a quarry mm -hmm. and the dust got up because I didn't keep distance between, uh, between Victor's vehicle. I, I wanted to do it in a hurry. You know, I didn't follow my own rules. I hit two anti-personnel mines. Um, my, my Pajero blew up every window, blasted out every component. Um, I, um, I suffered, I guess what's called a traumatic brain injury. Uh, I've lost most of my hearing in my right, my right ear. And, um, uh, the, I guess it was one of the final Ukrainian positions up in the hill with a with an anti tank weapon. The boys from ninety third brigade they they pulled me out of there. Um, it's, it's it's pretty sketchy in my head, like a bit, you know. But I I spent a month in hospital. Um, I was um, the, in, a, in a coma or no 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 no. Uh, I was very heavily medicated. Uh, I had some days in Nipro Hospital for ten days where I some were good days, bad days. Uh, I'd walk funny. Mm -hmm. Um, I heard there was a supermarket beyond, uh, on my third day there, I tried to pull a runner out of the hospital cause I heard there was like a pizza place. I don't know if you're going to edit this out, but I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, I made it to the gate and I thought, yeah, I'm going. I farted, but it weren't a fart, mate. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a, th I'm a 36 year old man. I shit myself before I can get out of the hospital. <laughs> If I'm not laughing, I'm crying. Yeah, I'm sorry. I hear you. Um, I, hear you. I um I, I, I went to Kiev. I, I went to the largest military hospital. They sent me on a train after ten days and, and I thought, what's wrong with me? Why why you know they're not telling me? Um that hospital's probably got over two thousand men in there. 
uh, men with no arms, no legs, men who look fine and ain't fine, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but any, any condition that's still with you from that blast? My cognitive function is slower. Um, I don't have tolerance for stupid people anymore. Um, my, my, I have to be very careful with my patients. I, I do have an insomnia. What's made you less patient? Yeah. Snappy. With stupid people, particularly with foreigners in Ukraine. Uh, well, you, you put that down to the blast, not yeah. just your patients running thin because of experience. I, I don't know. Probably, um, I, I don't, I get about five hours sleep a night. That's a good, that's a good night. That probably won't help. I took a sleeping pill one night, but the consequences in my head, what that did for me wasn't, wasn't worth it. Okay. I, I don't take any medication. Um, but I, I stayed, I, I went back to work. Do you ever regret your decision to go to Ukraine? No, not at all. Not at any point. Not when you're being shot at, not when you're sat behind a wall, no. missing home, missing no. the comforts. You don't know what I know. Of course you don't. It's not your life. Um, I got friends there. I got real friends. A few of the foreigners who stayed. Um, I've, got, I've, got, I've got Ukrainian friends. Uh, my best friend's a 19-year-old girl. She's a 19-year-old girl. Um, she's a paramedic. Uh, we we worked together on a, on the same team between Bakhmut and Soledar, right up till right up till about December first, uh, either evacuating civilians or uh, with casualties. I, I fundraised on the internet uh, on my YouTube. I, I'm I'm not massive, but I got a bit of a cult following. Um, I bought over a hundred diesel generators with it's not my money, it's theirs. 150 Motorola radios. Volunteers bring them. They come from England. I was going to ask you People that. People so, help me. So the, so the funding for this group organization you're working for is purely from donations? Well, my battalion is a volunteer battalion. Nobody's paid. Uh, but the welfare for us, I would say, was, is actually better than Ukrainian soldiers. All my medical... But who's funding that? Uh, Jana Zinkovich. Jana Zinkovich is my commanding officer. And she would be 30 years old now. She's a woman in a wheelchair. This war has been going on since 2014. She, she volunteered as a medic when she was 18 years old in Donbass. I think it was 20, 2016 she was wounded. She's in a wheelchair. She's, she's also 30 years old. She's a member of parliament in oh, Ukraine. Okay. She, she's funding it. Because, well, a lot of, we have a lot of volunteers that support our battalion. But if, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't have as good of equipment as I have. I wouldn't have as good armor. Ukrainian soldier... The people in our battalion are very, very, very well looked after. Mm. And I'd say we have more medical supplies than the average army medical unit. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's our job shocking. is to support army medical. Good, good for you. Shocking for them. Yeah. I'm, I'm very lucky, but I'm also a foreigner too. Uh, and I have a social media following. If I lose a finger, 20,000 people are going to cry. Uh, 10 Ukrainians die. Doesn't make the news. You, I mean, you've used, you're, you've grown your social media quite a bit. Your YouTube, yeah. as you said, That's is true. that is that helping gain resource as well as 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 creating awareness? Are you doing it for both reasons? Mm, I don't do it for awareness. I don't give a shit about awareness. And I'm, I'm going to tell you if you'll humour me. Oh, well. um, people want to say Slava Ukraine. They want to hang a flag. Eurovision, for example, that was supposed to be in Kiev, uh, but. It's not going to be in Kiev. It's in Liverpool. I love Liverpool. I'm very happy for them. But that's a cash grab. That's a corporate cash grab. That's exactly what it is. And I'm glad that people have a good time in Liverpool. But it has nothing to do with Ukraine. Okay. Uh, I think there's 10, 20 million people in the world that care about us, that follow us. It's not on the news. They go to YouTube. There's professionals who analyze the war. I don't watch that. It's not good for my mental health. But... There's people that buy us radios. There's people that buy us socks. And the army's got it all, but we don't have enough. Um, I think 20% 20, 20 minimum of the war effort uh, comes from civilian volunteers uh, and donors, probably mostly in Europe. Hmm. I'm, 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 I'm part of that. I'm just like a poster boy that speaks English. That's, I struggle with that. But So what, I'm a so big what part is of the that. reason you, you're posting everything? If it's not for awareness? Mm, no, it's not. It's for money. It's for money and supplies. When my truck blew up, that video, that, that went on like, I got like anywhere from five minutes to 
to like 30 seconds of coverage on national news in Canada. Um, even the Sun had a piece of that. Um, but so that, what does that mean though? Then people donate money to the cause. Well, my stock, because I went back to work at Rose. Um, I bought radios. I bought generators. Um, I bought, do you know how many tires I've bought? <laughs> I can only do you know how many? I, I, I went through four tires in a week once. Um, we just need, we need, we need. Um, but what happens? Do you, and do you have enough supplies and volunteers to help? Yes and no. It depends where it is. I reckon if everything was perfectly distributed in Ukraine, everybody'd have more or less what they need for, for a certain period of time. But some places have more, some have less. If you don't have social media, whether it's an individual or a unit, you have less. Um, so I'm going to say something you probably know nothing about, but there's a lot of people that follow Ukraine. And uh, I've worked a lot with 93 Brigade in, 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 in Bakhmut. And anyone who knows Ukraine, who follows the war, knows 93 Brigade. They're amazing. They're amazing. They're amazing. Who told you they were amazing? Social media told you they're amazing. And they are amazing. But so is 46 Brigade. Um, if you're a foreigner, and, and this is that's just the way the world works, um, we're all part of the problem. We're all part of the solution. In... I haven't done any civilian work with civilian evacuations uh, since the middle of, of January. Um, there's two British boys that died in Solodar. Uh, one of them, his name's Christopher Parry, he comes from Truro. Uh, the other one, I, I didn't know Chris. Uh, I knew Andrew Bagshaw, and he, he worked with civilian work. He was a geeky little scientist. Mm -hmm. And I've got no disrespect to the Paras, the SBS, all these things. And, and, and our culture adores them. But there was one man of that type. Um, Chris and Andrew went missing on the 6th of January. They, they went to Solodar to evacuate a woman. And um, on the 7th of January, I was asked, would I go to Solodar and try to evacuate that woman? Uh, we'd lost, I got blown up in Solodar in August. Mm -hmm. uh, the progress was very, very slow. Maybe the Russians made it four kilometers. In, since August, now we're in January. Um, Chris and Andrew hadn't been seen, and can I go look for them? Well, I'm not going on my own. I'm going to bring a Russian speaker, and I brought Dima, Dmitry, Nova Post Spetsnaz, the, mm -hmm. the guy who showed me how volunteers work, how, how the war really works. Um, and um, we got told at the last command post, uh, before going into the, what was left of the city, you can't go up the top road. The Russians pulled a pivot overnight. Overnight, they took the north side. They were going east, east, east. Just one night, one little pivot movement in, in one built-up area. Um, if, if we didn't talk to them, we would have drove up the road that we always go. We'd be dead. We drove into Solodar, uh, into the very last command post. There was one commander left, a drone operator, and uh, we seen your friend's vehicle. Uh, it was reported yesterday, a, a black discovery. Um, but you can't go there. That's impossible. And they showed us on the drones. So, you know, what happened over the next couple of days? I thought they were dead, but they're missing. The army tried to find them with drones because um, they're foreigners. They're not Ukrainian. They're important. You yeah, understand? Yeah, yeah, I understand. And uh, we got all these signal groups. It's like WhatsApp, chat groups mostly foreigners in there. Some of them do stuff. Some of them are just nosy. They might be in Kiev. I, I wrote in one of those group chats, I said, uh, please nobody go to Solodar today. Uh, and you get a lot of people back, I go where I want, I can do. I said, well, two British foreign volunteers are missing. And uh, and this is, this is who they are, because you're going to ask. But I, I knew a humanitarian worker, he wanted to bring water, in, water into the war zone. These are young people young people who um, who want to bring water to geriatrics, to stubborn old people who've had eight months to leave. And I said, uh, the Russians took the north side overnight and things are getting pretty bad in there. We made it to about, about 300 meters to where we think they went missing, which is Russian. Um, and you know what happened after that? It wasn't, it was that night, I think it was on, was it on TV5 or what was it? It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't BBC. And they were missing. It was on yeah. TV. 
Yeah, I remember, and I remember. do not I'm go to, to the media. The do not go to the media. Let the police do their job. And all, all of a sudden, over the next few days, there's people giving interviews to Sky. Oh, yeah, he was my best friend. He was my... And <laughs> do you know like when someone dies on Facebook? Do you know that slag? Oh, yeah, he was my heart and joy. Yeah. It was like, you hadn't seen him in two years. Yeah, yeah. The same <laughs> shit was happening over and over. And there was a man named uh, Craig, Craig Monaghan, one of these ex-commando types, who he, he, he met... Andrew once he said they never should have been in Ukraine they don't have military training and uh, and Andrew Bagshaw this little scientist he probably evacuated 500 people you know what I mean over the time dangerous places safe places do you know what I mean 500 to 1 if you think about that in a kill rate in a war that's a pretty shit hot soldier but he he was saving people and um, I kept my mouth shut about the whole thing I, I was in Solodar till the 13th of January uh, with the army with the evacuations I didn't post nothing on my social media uh, until it became public, uh, they're missing and then they're dead. Um, you know, once they died, all of a sudden Craig Monaghan says, the one who said they should, never should have been there, he was a hero. He was a hero. Do you know what I mean? Like you're saying one thing one day, you're saying one the other day. Um, I kept my mouth shut about the whole damn thing. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what I learned about that, like how the media, what you see, what's a buzzword, what really happens. I was I was completely shot uh, with civilian work um, in Solodar on the 13th. It's the closest I've ever been to the Russians in my life. And you could see them in the hills and, and we were between a gunfight. Um, that's all on my social media if you want to watch all the cool shit. Yeah. I was done with civilians. In the month of January, from that point on, 10 foreigners died in Bakhmut, not including the Legion. Humanitarian workers, Americans, British, Pol Polish never made the news because they're Polish. I'm sorry, but not, I'm a little bit cynical. Yet 10, 10 volunteers died in Bakhmut and, and I, I'd never done, I didn't have the stomach anymore. I, um, I, I only do army evacuations. I only do medical evacuation for the army. I, I don't, I can't do civilian work anymore. Really? Maybe if I got asked, I've, I've done one in Avdivka, south of Bakhmut in March, only because I was asked. I, I just, uh, there's young, beautiful people you know, Andrew was a geneticist. He's got published papers. Uh, he's a PhD scientist. Chris Parry was a running coach in Truro. I never met him, but uh, spunky as you like. Uh, young people who come to Ukraine, like go-getters, and they're risking their life day in and day out for stubborn people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who don't want to go. I, I'm not a Mr. Big, but I, 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 I struggled with that, but I, I felt my life was worth more than that. Hmm. I felt... I've lost friends in Ukraine. One of the guys I came with, he, he's dead. You know, young Matt, 24 years old, as gorgeous as you like, you know, arms the size of your legs, Swedish boy, Nico. Um, yeah, he, he, he died in December in Bakhmut uh, on an evacuation um, in a car wreck. He, he didn't. This war. How are you, Brendan, dealing with all of this? Because, yeah, you've had a, you know, Mixed upbringing, but some of the shit you sound like you've seen out there. Where's your head at? Like, are you suffering when you're here? Are certain noises triggering you? Is it? Are you getting any help? You know, where's yeah? Where's your mental health at? Where's your head at? So I'm usually pretty good there. Um, on med points, if we have a shell scrape or a hole, we dig in, um, or we stay in the vehicle undercover. We don't go out of the house as much. Um, I really struggle there with fear um, at night when I'm, when, as soon as, it doesn't matter if I'm wearing helmet and armor, as soon as my boots are off, when the house shakes, something can hit a kilometer away and, and the house vibrates. But if I got my boots off lying down, I'm scared. I'll be honest with you, I'm really scared. Um, Why? Because I'm vulnerable. M my house, uh, a month, about a month before I came back, um, in a village, not a city, you hear about the missile attacks. We got hit by a missile. Uh, one of the walls collapsed. And um, two, that was my, my milestone as a medic. Um, uh, two of the guys got hurt outside. They, they killed our cats. But uh, I was in sandals, flip-flops. I'll tell you what, when, when, when your windows crush in and you've got shards of glass everywhere and you've got to jump out a window to go help people, you don't feel too clever in flip-flops, do you? Um, when I come home, you know, that was a big thing for me when that missile hit. If it had to come 10 meters forward and hit the pavement, not the soft soil, we'd be dead. But um, 
you know, I, anyway, I was the medic, um, and it was all good. But when I go, when I go to bed now at night, um, just the other night, my cousin, she bought a house uh, in Peckham Rye in London. And when the train goes by at night, there's a little rattle. And just for a second, I got to remind myself like the, it's vibrations. Um, I, I live in Sweden before the war. I, I went directly to Sweden from Ukraine before I come back here. Um, biggest military exercise in the history of Sweden was going on. People from all over the world, Aurora 23. And I, I had my first day all to myself because I've been doing a lot of media things. Uh, and, and I, I went right down to the shop, took my dog out, uh, took my dog out in the morning. I bought bacon, I bought eggs, I bought my favorite cereal and, and I'm going to watch the Sopranos all day. It's only me in the house, you know? And, um, and I was, I was into about the second episode, a fighter jet flew over my house. Um, a fighter jet flew over my house and, and I had a, like a, like a little panic attack. I, I, I and I, I, like for 30 seconds, um, we don't have a lot of aircraft in the war. Pe people like to criticize us there, but but I'd like to see who. Again, no offense, no offense to some of these great guys here, but we're not fighting Muslims five to one. <laughs> we're outgunned. We don't have aircraft. I, I've, I I haven't seen ten times in the whole war a fighter jet. I've seen them drop before. It's pretty cool, mm. <laughs> and then they fly by. They actually do like in the movies. They do that wave to us yeah. if they know there's a group of us. You know how we with the wing. Yeah. Oh my God, that's a great feeling. Um, I'll even say Slava Ukraine then, and um, but we don't see them. I was so terrified because it just in, whenever we hear an aircraft, so, something really bad is going to happen. Yeah, real real bad. I I. Um, I, I'll tell you something I really struggle with. Um, I'm a dancing bear since I've been back to people. Do you know how many people in Ukraine that are volunteers? I don't know what they do in Dnipro, Kiev, foreigners. They follow my Instagram or my YouTube. I'd love to meet you for dinner. I'm like, but why? What are we going to talk about? Have you got humanitarian aid? Have you got, not to be rude. Um, I, a lot of people have wanted to talk to me. Since I've come home, people want to buy me lunch. People never met me before. I've only accepted one offer for lunch. Uh, they want to have lunch. They want to have a beer. Well, obviously, they didn't follow my social media too much. I've been in recovery for 11 years. Um, they, they don't, they're not interested in me. They want to hear a story that they, I'd rather just charge them 100 euros. I'll buy my own coffee. Um, there's one person I went out with, and she, was, she recognized me. Five people have recognized me in the streets uh, in, in Stockholm where I was living because of my YouTube yeah. And she was a 60 year old woman. She's like, I heard your voice. Wow. Yeah. And she's a school teacher named Anna. And, uh, and I, I, she, you know what she started asking me about? She asked me about my dog, Masa, because I, I got pictures of my dog. I brought me from the UK and I talk about my dog. People have made merchandise for fundraiser out of my dog. I, I don't want an AK like my Chevron here. This is my, un, this is my, this is my unit. Uh, I said, I wanted, uh, I want to be my dog. She started asking me about my dog. And I said, well, do you want to go for a walk with me and my dog? And uh, I've seen Anna a few times. She talked to me about normal stuff. She talked to me about being a teacher, about how her sister's like multiple personality and, and is the stress of her life. Uh, normal shit, <laughs> you know. Um, do you the, miss that, Brendan? Yeah, I do. The I do. Stuff? I do miss that because these people want to meet me and it's like I'm, a, I'm like a dancing bear for them. Um, I'm going to tell you one here in Bournemouth. He, he's, he's not, I like him, but he's not a friend. Okay. I like him. He's a buddy. He's a pal but he's not a friend. Maybe Chris Billum Smith has to deal with that too nowadays. A, a lot of people, I love Chris, but I, I respect him that he don't have time to even shake my hand. He's training for the biggest fight of his life. I want to go for a Toby Carvery last night, but all of a sudden these people want to go out for a Toby Carvery with me. And, and, and this guy's a good guy. Um, and we we're queued up there and, and Les, who I'm staying with, who you yeah, met, my yeah, old boxing yeah, I know coach. Les, I know Les, Les, great guy, yeah. Les will talk, he wants to talk about Ukraine, but he want, we would talk about boxing. This guy said, what's the most, what's the most vile thing you've seen? What's the, what's the most thing you've seen? I said, well, Jesus, I told him about the dancing bear. Do you know how that hurts, Stu? Mm -hmm. I said, and I got thinking, I guess, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something. And I waited till, he, till we got our meals. I said, sit down. Les is like, I don't want to see. I said, you don't have to, but he's going to see it. And I... I'll never upload this, but I have my camera working, uh, me zipping up a body with half his head blowing off. Probably would have been 22 years old. That was my last night work in Avdivka. Do you know what I did my last night of war? 
I, I brought a dead guy out, a guy with a concussion. I sat around for three hours, about two kilometers from the shelling. I played Grand Theft Auto on my phone. I was so bored. Mm. I can't do nothing about the shelling. I just got to wait for casualties. And then I took, we took 11 guys out that night um, later. But I showed him that video of that guy with his head. No, you look at that. You wanted this. You look at that. And do you know what? He is a nice guy, but I don't really want to know him anymore. Do you know what I mean? I'm not your dancing bear. Mm -hmm. I drove you home drunk from the boxing before. You know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a good guy to know. You know what I mean? I so I ain't going to be no one's dancing bear. I'll talk to you because we can talk to other people. Mm -hmm. I go to the, I've talked to the TA. I've talked to, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here doing my job. Yeah. Okay. To get more see. support from my unit. And when I do self-promotion, it's going to be after the war. If anyone wants to read my book, I'm going to sell that for me. And hopefully I can get a mortgage out of it because I'm 37 and I got nothing. But I'm not, I'm not going out to have a beer with people. Will you go back, Brandon? Yep. One month. One month. That was a very quick yes. Yep. Why? Because I'm good at what I do. Uh, I got friends who trust me. Uh, do you have any family here, Brandon? As in, do you have a partner, kids? I got a girlfriend and it's really messy. And uh, she's very proud of me, but she's very resentful. I, I don't know what's going to come of that. Can you understand why she's resentful? Yep. But the good of the many outweigh the good of the few. Any kids? No. I've got my dog. What, what breed is this dog, by the way? <laughs> Mossa. Mossa is 19 different races. You know, we're, we're like, we, she's spoiled. We ordered the DNA test and she's the cutest little thing in the world. Um, what does she look like in terms of like she's, about describing... the, she's taller than a working cocker okay okay and she's white she's got the non-molten coat yeah and we adopted her she was one year old and um do you know what that dog means to me i was living in sweden before this i was a bus wanker you know i didn't know no one i speak i speak fluent swedish you how many englishmen do you know that can do more than order a beer in spanish I wanted to learn Swedish. I could read it. But you know what? They don't want to speak to you in Stockholm. No one will speak to you. I could read it. But once I got a dog, they would start talking to me because I had a dog. One minute became five minutes. Four months later, I passed a Swedish job interview. Wow. Yeah, because of my dog. Um, now, I got to go back. Um, I went through a briefing in Kiev from my unit, what I'm allowed to talk about, what I'm not allowed to talk about. It's not much, not secret it's actually common sense once it was of explained course. to me. Um, but I asked some of my friends, like, uh, do, in, in spirit, can I speak for you? And they're like, yeah. I'm talking about soldiers, you know, like Pasha, Volva, Dima, Sasha, weird names to you, you know, just, is it all right if I... Yeah, they can't leave the country until they turn 65 or the war ends. I remember reading that. They can't leave the country. The news, yeah. I mean... What could our listeners do to help support Ukraine? Well, like genuinely help support because I, I'm sat here in the comfort of my home, and it's not just with Ukraine. It happens with everything. It happens with an yeah. earthquake. Happens with a war in the Middle East. Happens with, and you're watching stuff on the news. You don't know half of it if it's true or not. If it's propaganda, you might share a post. You might, do, you know. But what can we actually do to make a difference without coming well, like you to the front line? The truth is, uh, I know what I know. I'll tell you right now, if anybody says they know 100%, they're full of shit. Um, it's a very big war. It's a very big war. Um, I'm going to plug my social media. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, it's fine. We'll uh, do it at the end of this thing anyway. Yeah. Uh, when this goes live. If you're on Instagram, you can follow active volunteers in Ukraine, like what they're doing humanitarian-wise. And I wouldn't recommend donating money to them right away. If you're curious, follow them for a few weeks. Watch if you what like, they're doing. Yeah, watch what they're doing. Uh, and if you feel comfortable... Do it. Uh, What's your Instagram handle? Mine, Ukraine. Well, just type in Brandon Mitchell, but uh, Ukraine TBIC. It means the best I can. TBIC. I was wondering what that was. Um, and on your YouTube channel, Brandon Mitchell? Brandon Mitchell. Um, and what I've done on there, um, a lot of my friends who are volunteers that I've worked, only people I've worked with and known, I've, I've done like, uh, you'll see them in some of my action videos, some of the other yeah, things yeah, we're working. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've shouted them and I put their social media because, because YouTube takes me about, if I'm honest, takes about two to four hours a day at night. Like I'm, um, I do it all on my phone. I can imagine. Yeah. And like, for example, 
If you believe in the civilian work, well, support that volunteer. I'm, I'm going to make a play. I haven't done it yet. I'm going to make a like a, a playlist. Okay. If you want, I don't do civilian work. If you want to support Ignat, if that's what you believe in, uh, if you want to support Dimitri, uh, he, he now builds drones. We need people who are like computer nerds, basically. Um, we need people to go on eBay in Europe and and buy us used components. I don't know how to do that, but there's a lot of tech inclined people, mm -hmm. and they do want to be involved, but they don't want to just give money. We need people who know. are who are willing to like just half hour a week, you know, look on eBay. Oh, I can buy that component. It's only going to get blown up anyway yeah. when it hits a Russian tank. Um, I now buy night vision and thermal scopes uh, before I go home. Uh, do you hear what I just said? Yeah. <laughs> before I go back to Ukraine. Uh, it's interesting that. Um, I wonder if your brain thought that home is Ukraine or whether you're still there and you thought you were coming here. Which way around do you reckon it triggered then? I got to go take a course. Um, I'm going to do some speaking gigs in Canada. Uh, and I'm, I've got some very large media engagements. I'm going uh, to Texas. I'm taking a shooting course. Where else would you go? Texas. I buy thermal scopes for soldiers now. Thermal scopes for Maxime. Um they're a special team. They were in the house when it got blown up. He changed the whole war for me. Why am I buying tourniquets to save people's lives? Um, preventative medicine. Thermal scopes is like GTA on cheap mode. It's Grand Theft Auto on cheap mode. Mm -hmm. It happens at night. I, I've I've bought about oh about twenty five of them so far. I've I've bought night vision. I've worked on M one one three. That's an armored carrier from the personal aid. Our machine gunners have it. Some of them do, some of them don't. That comes from foreign aid. Joe Biden doesn't give us the small shit. He gives us the missiles. People don't understand that. Um, I've I've raised about, ooh, about 350 grand since wow. I've been there. And I'm pretty straight with what I do. Um, I do eat better than everyone. I won't lie there. But anyone who's with me eats better. Um, but now I, I, I've, I've, I've spent uh, just on radios alone. I'm going to plug in my social media. They're in Widness. They're in Liverpool. If you want to buy us a radio, someone didn't want to give me the money, uh, but Radio Trader, they bought three for us. He wanted to buy it himself. That was almost a thousand quid. Wow. They send they send them over to us. That's what I'm doing on my social media. If you don't want to support me with the thermal scopes, I'm going to Texas to take a course on that. So I not only that, I can teach it. I can teach it. That's what I'm doing. Brendan, just before we finish, yeah. what did that mean to you a minute ago? I see you getting a little bit emotional when you said home. Where is home? Home was in Bournemouth when I was with the kids, with like Anna, Wes. Anna's a Polish girl, girl in the gym. Wes is a black boy from Zimbabwe. He's got a chip on his shoulder for white. But when he first came around, I took him to, I took him to the British Boxing Hall of Fame dinner. Tony Belly was getting inaugurated. He looked all around and uh, he's like, what, what fork do I eat with, bruv? You know, sitting with ex-Welsh champions, like they're posh. I said, Wes, you see all these old white men here. You're going to go to the top. You, they're going to get you there. You know, like that was home, be, being with them. That was home. Uh, I'm do, It's the most good I can do. It's the most good I can do, uh, what we're doing there. Huge uh, respect, mate. Yeah, mate. A real pleasure to be with you. And, and if you'll humor me, uh, I don't really want any fame or anything. I, I, I'm getting that as a byproduct, a small thing. But, you know, s some of my happiest memories here in Bournemouth, I, I had a van. One of my friends, once he was in trouble with his wife, he forgot to take the bins out for two weeks. His name's Ross, Ross the boss. And um, he asked me if I could help him take his bins. That sounds silly, but that was one of my happiest days. I went back, had lunch with him and his wife and the kids. Because to me, it was always... Uh, I always wanted to help my friends, but I was always the kind of guy that I'd give you the shirt off my back. Mm -hmm. um, I know that feeling. Yeah, and 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 I got a lot. A lot of people gave me good here, but the way kind of people are uptight in England, everywhere in the world, I I could only give as good to them as they'd let me. But like, I, I just it's been very gratifying on a personal level. Like any of my friends that know, I really would have given you the shirt off my back if you only would have asked. That's what I get personally out of my 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. Brendan, thank you so much for sharing your story. Cheers, mate. Ty, you're all right. I don't thank care you, what brother. Jake Best says about you. <laughs>